Good morning. We're going to get started. We're going to we're going to um, do chapter six today, which of course everybody knows will not be on the midterm, right? Are there any questions about the midterm before we get started? Anybody? Yes. Will the will the what? The content about lipids and the saturations. Oh, um, she asked about lipids. Whether the saturations. That's not something we do till later. That will not be on the test. Yeah. More questions. Here's your chance. <laughs> yes. So this happened this week. The chapter. Due Wednesday. It's due Wednesday. Okay and. Um, I haven't opened up chapter six. Who wants uh, chapter six opened up right now? Okay. I'll do that later today. Okay? In chapter six, you guys will like chapter six. It's, it's got a lot of GCAM in it, and um, it's not super hard. When we finished chapter six, remember we were building that foundation? We spent the whole quarter doing the foundation. We'll be done with the foundation after chapter six and then we start building up, okay? So hopefully you have a good foundation so that we can do that. All right. And then I think after this chapter we are officially done with things you, you need to know from GCAM, okay? so. All right, so um, we tend to um, we tend to focus on the uh, organic reagents when we're doing a reaction. We tend to um, overly focus on the organic reagents, and we can write the other reagents that are not organic, or uh, we can write them here. But we commonly will write them over the arrow, like this. We can also sometimes include other reaction parameters, like, for example, we could be more specific. You could do this reaction, we can have bromine uh, H nu, which means light of a certain frequency or heat. We also can sometimes write the solvent. And then we just write the overall transformation. So again, the focus here is on what's happening to the our organic compound that we started with. How are we changing it into something else? So uh, let me just label a few of these things. This is light. delta for heat, and carbon tetrachloride in this case is the solvent. There's no rule about what goes above the arrow and what goes below. So you could put the uh, light or heat above the arrow and the carbon tetrachloride on the bottom. This isn't, you know, there's no rules about what, what has to go above and what has to go below. Um, sometimes we do more than one reaction, and we, if we do that, we number the steps. And again, there's no rule about does the number one go on top of the double, number two go below the arrow. There's no rule. It's just you do have to number the steps if you're doing uh, more than one step. So this would be step one, and this would be step two. And we also um, often leave off byproducts or side products that are formed in a reaction. So, for example, this particular reaction has a side product. This would be our um, side product or byproduct. You could say that either way. Are often left out. Say that again? Where? I'm not. <coughs> oh, this is a free radical reaction for that one. Yeah, that's a free radical. That's a different reaction. Okay, so byproducts are um, often left out. Again, focuses on the overall transformation.
All right, so um, that's just a little bit different way of writing, writing chemical reactions. We also want to talk about kinds of organic reactions. So in GCHEM you had oxidation reduction, you had, um, what were some of the other ones? Single displacement, double displacement, things like that. So we have our own reaction types in organic chemistry. We still have oxidation reduction and we'll be doing that, at, covering that at some point. But we also have some other reaction types, substitution reaction, where the Y replaces the Z. So if we go from the left to the right, we have a Y here and the Y replaces the Z. So that's a substitution reaction. Here's some examples. We will see some of these in chapter seven. So, and that we'll be doing, we'll be doing chapter seven next. So here's a, we, we're gonna take this chloride ion and we're gonna, re, we're gonna substitute the chloride ion for the iodine. So that, that's, you can see where you get that name substitution. So the chlorine will be bonded to the methyl. And so Cl replaces iodine. That's chapter seven. We're also going to talk about a, a, another type of substitution reaction. This will not be until 51C, but we would have the hydroxide replace the chlorine, or you can think of it in your mind. We're substituting the hydroxide for the chlorine. Helps you to see that that's a substitution reaction. This is a completely different type of substitution reaction. Again, not something we worry about until this will be in chapter 22. So chapter 22 for this one. And here OH replaces CL. So that's a substitution reaction. Um, we also have elimination reactions and in an elimination reaction elements of the starting material are lost and a pi bond is formed. So that's the key thing to look for when we're forming a new pi bond in a reaction. This is a really good way to do that. So what we're going to be doing is we have a sigma bond here to X and we have a sigma bond here to Y and uh, the two sigma bonds are going to be broken. <coughs> we form a new pi bond, it would look like this and then we, the X and the Y combine. So here's our new pi bond. So I think completely different than anything that you did in GCAM. I don't, I can't think of an example of something that would look like this. Here's an example here that we will see in chapter eight. So not something you have to memorize or learn at this point. These are just examples. So right now you just need to recognize the reaction that's taken place. So we're going to lose HBr. We're going to form a new pi bond between the two carbons. So we'll make an alkene. And HBr. So actually what we end up getting here is um, rather than HBr we get um, H H3O plus and Br minus. So not something we have to worry about. That's not important at this point. All right. Here's another example here. H2SO4. Actually, I drew this one wrong. I'm, I'm realizing as I'm looking at it right now, this would be um, H2O, sorry, H2O and Br minus. And I wanted one more label on that, that this is chapter eight. So this will be the first chapter we do coming back from um, winter break. So this is chapter eight. 
All right, second example is uh, what we call a dehydration. It's also an, an elimination reaction. We'll learn it by both terms. But we're going to lose water here and make a new pi bond. So loss of H2O and a new pi bond. This will be chapter 9. So it's an elimination and uh, also dehydration. A dehydration is a particular type of elimination where you lose water. All right, so um, we're also, a, a third reaction type is uh, addition reactions and in addition reaction elements add to a starting material. This is what happens here, pi bond is broken. And we add the elements of X and Y across the double bond. So X goes on one side, Y goes on the other. Two new sigma bonds formed. That looks like the opposite of an elimination, doesn't it? And it actually is, it's the opposite, exact opposite of elimination. Um, this is something that we're going to talk about in chapter uh, 10. So at this point you're just, you're just recognizing the type of reaction. When we get to chapter 10, you're going to learn how to predict products. You're going to know, you're going to learn how which carbon gets the X, which carbon gets the Y, and all of that much more detail. Right now, you're just recognizing reaction types. So here's an example from chapter 10. We have an alkene plus HBr. And so your product looks like this. Hydrogen goes on one side, bromine goes on the other. So HBr addition, again chapter 10. We also can add water across the double bond if we use an acid catalyst and so that would look like this. H2O addition, water addition. This also will be chapter 10. So right now, again, just, just learning reaction types. So you already noticed this, that addition is the exact opposite of elimination. So sometimes we'll have the reactions going both ways in an equilibrium. We're going to have to drive the equilibrium to be able to get addition product or elimination product. So that's something that we're going to have to think about when we get to chapter 10. So elimination going this way minus xy and addition going this way plus xy. So in an elimination, we form a, a pi bond. And in addition, we break a pi bond. Questions so far? Anybody? All right.
We will also have oxidation reduction reactions, but we're not going to talk about those until um, chapter 15. All right, so something that we do in organic chemistry that's very different than general chemistry is reaction mechanisms, and those are a really part, important part of this class. A reaction mechanism is a detailed description of how bonds are broken and formed as starting materials converted to product. Curved arrows are used to show the mechanism of a reaction, and we've already learned how to do that with acid-base reactions. We've learned how to use curvy arrows going from one resonance structure to another, and for a chemical reaction in the acid-base chapter, we used curvy arrows. So we're going to be using those for all different reaction types. So um, in the acid-base chapter, the acid-base reactions were one step. Sometimes we have more than one step. So a one-step reaction is called a concerted reaction. Bonds are made and broken in the same step. So the best example of that is, of course, the one we're already familiar with, and that's the acid-base reaction. And once we transfer that proton, the hydroxide picks up a proton and is water, and ammonium ion converts to ammonia. And so this, of course, is our classic Bronsted acid-base reaction. And so in this reaction, the OH bond and the NH bond are broken at the same time. OH bond formed. And the nitrogen-hydrogen bond broken simultaneously. So at the same time. And that's, that's what happens in a concerted reaction. We also are going to run across reactions that are stepwise. So a stepwise reaction involves more than one step. A starting material is first converted to an unstable reactive intermediate, which then goes on to form product. So here's a, a two-step reaction. Arrow comes from the pi bond. We grab the hydrogen. We break the hydrogen-bromine bond. Now that proton is going to go on either, on either carbon. It doesn't matter in this case. So, but let's draw what we get here. I'm going to put it on the left-hand side. And that leaves the right-hand side carbon without an octet, so a carbocation. And that's our reactive intermediate. What type of reaction is that first step? Hmm? It's, it's, it, you could call it a Lewis acid-base reaction. You could also call it a, a Bronsted acid-base reaction, right? Because we're transferring a proton, aren't we? Okay, so um, this one here. Overall reaction is going to be addition. Let's do the second step and then we'll label each reaction. So the first step is definitely a Bronsted acid base. If we want to be as specific as possible, we would say it's a Bronsted acid base reaction. Our conjugate base is bromide ion. And now we're looking, and now we're looking more like you can kind of predict what's going to happen. The carbon doesn't have an octet. The, bro, the bromide ion has lone pairs, and the bromide ion is going to donate a pair of electrons to the carbon. That's more of a classic Lewis acid base reaction, right? They both are technically by definition, but if we want to be the most specific as possible, we would call that first reaction a Bronsted acid base reaction because it is a proton transfer. So let's label each of the um, steps here. Overall, what's the type of reaction? Breaking a pi bond, adding two elements across the pi bond, so that's an addition. Overall reaction is addition. 
the first step is a um, Bronsted acid base reaction. The second step, um, there is no proton transferred. It's a Lewis acid base reaction, a classic Lewis acid base, where we have something with lone pairs attacking something that has, does not have an octet. Questions so far? All right, we also want to talk about bond cleavage. Bonds are broken and formed in all chemical reactions. There's only two ways to break a, a bond. Homolysis is also called hom homolytic bond cleavage. Looks like this. Notice my curvy arrows look a little strange. They only have a single head, not, not a double-headed arrow. They're not double-headed arrows. With a double-headed arrow, we move two electrons. Um, this is called a fish hook arrow because it looks exactly like a fish hook, and that moves one electron. So got to keep that straight. Fish hook arrow. for movement of one electron. So what we're doing is that, that covalent bond between the, the um, A and the B is two electrons. One's going to A, the other one's going to B. Uh, when we break bonds homolytically, we get radicals. So you'll see these called radicals. You'll see them called free radicals. I usually call them free radicals. And these are um, reactive intermediates. Very rarely are they stable. So these are reactive intermediates. Again, very unstable. And they're reactive intermediates in radical reactions. So we will be learning about these more in depth in chapter 15. So this is coming up. So we've got a lot of stuff coming up in chapter in um, 51B. So in 51B, um, you know, we have our good foundation. In 51B, each chapter is another story. We're going to see building up, up, up. All right. We also, we're more familiar with heterol heterolysis, so our heterolytic bond cleavage. And that's where we use our double-headed arrows that we're, that we're hopefully used to by now. I can take the... I can take the two electrons in that shared covalent bond, I can move them on to bromine, or I could take the two electrons in the shared covalent bond and move them on to A. And that's not bromine, just B. I can move them on to A or B. If I move them on to B, I end up with A plus and B minus. If I move those electrons on to A, I, I get A minus, and B plus. So which direction do we go? We go, if we have differing electronegativities between A and B, it's going to go to the more electronegative atom. Okay, so just like when we were drawing resonance structures. So which direction? Will electrons go when A and B have different electronegativities?
the electrons go to the more electronegative atom. So as you can see, homolysis generates radicals. Um, heterolysis generates charged species, so ions, okay? Homolysis and heterolysis of a CZ bond generates the three most important reactive intermediates in organic chemistry. So let's do um, an example for each of these. So um, here, if Z is more electronegative, So Z is standing here for anything other than carbon, okay? So if Z is more electronegative, then we would go like this. Push electrons onto Z. And we would get carbocation and Z minus. So carbocation, is that electron rich or electron poor? Yeah. Electron poor, so it's an electrophile. So heterolysis, when C is more electronegative, that's going to look like this. We're going to push electrons onto carbon instead. Another very important reactive intermediate is a carbanion. Electron rich or electron poor? Rich. So electron rich, and so that's going to be a nucleophile. And the third um, important reactive intermediate in organic chemistry is our radicals, a carbon radical. So again, I'm going to use my single headed arrows. One electron goes to carbon and one electron goes to Z. So that's a carbon radical. It is uncharged. So this would be carbon if you just plucked it right off the um, periodic table. And if you count it, and so if you count electrons, carbon still is, is electron deficient. It needs one more electron. So it's also electron deficient carbon. So carbanions and carbocations, those are really important inter, uh, intermediates in polar reactions. Important intermediates in polar reactions. Where a nucleophile reacts with an electrophile. And I want to say probably 80% of the reactions that we do in this class maybe 80 to 85 percent of the reactions we do in this class involve um, uh, polar, re there are polar reactions where a nucleophile reacts with an electrophile. And then we have another subset here. Carbon radicals are intermediates in free radical reactions. So in this chapter, they're going to basically what we're going to, I, I will show you an overall reaction and you draw arrows to get to the product. The products will be clearly drawn for you. When we actually talk about these reactions, when we get to the chapters where we talk about these reactions, you'll be predicting the products and 
um, and drawing arrow pushing to get to those products. So that's the difference. Questions? Anybody? Yeah. It's more of the reaction, the reagents that you use. And that will become more clear as we cover these reactions. Okay? All right. All right, let's talk about bond formation. So we, we just talked about how, how we break bonds. Um, let's talk about how we form bonds. And so how we form bonds is going to depend on what we're starting with. We're, these are our three major reactive intermediates in organic chemistry. So we have a radical, a carbanion, and a carbocation. So what radicals, um, the arrow pushing that we use for radicals is using single headed arrows. So reaction with HBr for example. So we're going to break this bond between hydrogen and bromine homolytically. One electron is going to bromine. The other electron, the way we draw the arrows for this, it looks like it's combining in, in midair here. So that single electron is going to combine with the carbon to make a new carbon hydrogen bond and that's how we draw the arrows for that. Uh, this is what the product would look like. So the radical donates one electron. So that I'm sure is probably looking a little strange to you. The carbanion and the carbocation should look a little more familiar. So for a carbanion, if we react that with HBr, you've seen this type of arrow pushing before. This is what we saw in the acid base chapter. Arrow is going to come from the lone pair on carbon, going to grab the uh, hydrogen, and we're going to break the hydrogen bromine bond. And then we get a bromide ion. So carbon ion donates a pair of electrons. So those two different reactive intermediates reacting completely differently with HBr. Uh, carbocation is not going to react with HBr because H, they're, they're both um, carbons, th this carbon is electron deficient and HBr is not um, electron rich. So we're not going to react with HBr, we're going to react with Br minus. And this would be your classic Lewis acid base reaction that we're familiar with. So the carbocation accepts a pair of electrons. Questions about bond formation, anybody? All right, let's talk about um, bond association energy and this you will recognize from GCAM. You will I'm almost certainly recognize this from high school chemistry if you had high school chemistry before you came to UCI. So bond association energy is the energy needed to homolytically cleave a covalent bond. So by definition it's homo homolytic cleavage. So the energy absorbed or released, so we'd be having one electron go to each atom. Energy absorbed or released in any reaction symbolized by delta H naught is called the enthalpy change or the heat of reaction. So when delta H naught is positive, energy is absorbed and the reaction is endothermic. When delta H naught is negative, energy is released and the reaction is exothermic. Okay? 
So if we look at the reaction of uh, uh, breaking H2, we're going to have one electron go to hydrogen, we're going to have one electron go to the other hydrogen to give us two hydrogen radicals. And if you go back to chapter one, we saw that when we combine two hydrogen radicals into H2, it, 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 it releases 104 kcals per mole. So that means in order to break this bond, we have to add back that 104 kcals per mole. Really doesn't want to do this. So um, bond breaking is endothermic, always. If we have energy stored in that bond for H2, that energy stored is 104 kcals per mole, then in order to break that, we have to add that energy. We have to put energy in to break that bond. So to go back the other direction, which is what we talked about in chapter one, delta H naught equals minus 104. We released 104 kcals per mole. So energy is released. So bond making is exothermic. Let's look at some trends for bond strength. We kind of talked a little bit about this in chapter one, so let's sort of add on to that. The stronger the bond, the higher its bond association energy. That makes sense. If we have a really strong bond and we want to break that strong bond, we're going to have to put in a lot of energy to break that bond. So table 6.2 gives bond association energies for some common bonds seen in organic chemistry. Notice some trends here. What's happening to bond strength as we go to the right? It's increasing. Bond strength increases. And we know from chapter one that the bond length is also going to, is, is going to decrease. So we know the shorter the bond, the stronger the bond. So we're having shorter bonds going across any row in the periodic table, so then bond strength is going to increase as we go across. So no big news there. We also have the same thing happening when we go up a column here. Bond strength is uh, increasing. And we also have the same thing happening here. Bond length is, all, is decreasing at the same time. So shorter bonds are stronger bonds. So no, no, no new news here. Bond association energies can be used to calculate the enthalpy change in a reaction in which several bonds are broken and formed. Delta H naught indicates the relative strengths of the bonds broken and formed in a reaction. If you have a positive delta H naught, more energy is needed to break bonds than is released from forming bonds. The bonds broken in the starting material are stronger than the bonds formed in the product and therefore it is an endothermic reaction. And generally speaking, endothermic reactions are not favored. Uh, when delta H is negative, more energy is released in forming bonds that is needed to break bonds. The bonds formed in the product are stronger than the bonds broken in the starting materials, and that is an exothermic reaction.
so to determine the overall delta H reaction, begin with the balanced equation. Add up all the bond association energy for bonds broken. This plus value is the energy needed to break bonds. We always have to put in energy to break bonds. Then we're going to add up all the bonds formed, and that will be a negative value because we always release energy when we form bonds. And then we're just going to add the two together. So delta H naught. Energy of bonds broken. That's going to be a positive value, right? Minus energy of bonds formed. So that's this value, this negative value right here. But you're taking the positive value of that, right? You're not going to do Exactly. Yeah, we're adding together the values. So you can do it by subtracting the positive or you can do it by adding the negative. Okay? We'll see. Well, I'll show you an example. All right, so let's do an example here. Calculate the standard enthalpy change for the following oxidation. We're breaking four carbon hydrogen bonds, aren't we? So I'm going to do bonds broken here on the left, and then I'm going to do bonds formed on the right. So each of these carbon hydrogen bonds is worth 104, so this is 4 times uh, 104, and that's equal to uh, plus 416. We're breaking bonds, we need to put in energy, so that's a positive number. We're also breaking two oxygen-oxygen bonds. That's 119 each, so 2 times 119 equals plus 238. And if you add the two together, you get plus 654 kcals per mole. Bonds formed. When we form bonds, we release energy. So I'm going to give all of these numbers a negative value. So I'm forming um, carbon dioxide minus 128 times 2. So minus uh, 256. I'm also forming water. So I'm forming a new oxygen-hydrogen bond. And I'm going to be doing, since there's two of them, there's two per uh, water and there's two all together, that's four. So minus 119 times four. That's equal to uh, minus 476. We add the two together, it's minus 7. Uh, 32 kcals per mole. And I'm going to add these two numbers together overall. Delta H naught equals 654 minus 732 and that's equal to minus 78 kcals per mole. So exothermic reaction, right? Questions on how I did that? Anybody? Yes? This one right here? So we're making, we don't have any water here at all, so we're going to be making two oxygen-hydrogen bonds per water molecule, and there's two water molecules. Okay? More questions? All right, we're going to start talking about thermodynamics and kinetics. For reaction to be practical, the equilibrium must favor the products, and the reaction rate must be fast enough to form in a reasonable period of time. These two conditions depend on the thermodynamics and kinetics. So we're going to talk about thermodynamics first, and then we're going to talk about kinetics. And pretty much all of this should be review. If you don't forget it, we're going over it right now. 
So thermodynamics describes energy and equilibrium. How do the energy of the reactants and products compare, which we just did here? Delta H naught. Uh, what are the relative amounts of reactants and products at equilibrium? That would be um, K, right? Equilibrium constant KEQ is a mathematical expression that relates to the amount of starting material and product at equilibrium. So hopefully you remember this from GCHEM. It's concentration of products over reactants. That's equal to concentration of C to the S power, whatever S is, the coefficient, times D to the T power, whatever that number is in front of the D, divided by concentration of A to the M power, divided by concentration of B to the N power. Size of KEQ tells us about the position of equilibrium. It just tells us whether starting materials or products predominate at, at equilibrium after we've reached equilibrium. So that's really similar to what we did in the acid base chapter. It's exactly what we did in the acid base chapter. So if KEQ is greater than one, equilibrium favors products. The equilibrium lies to the uh, right as, it's as the equation is written. When KEQ is less than one, then equilibrium favors reactants. The equilibrium lies to the left as the equation is written. So again, this is exactly like our acid-based reactions that we were doing. So what determines whether equilibrium favors products in a given reaction? The relative concentration of reactants and products. The position of equilibrium is determined by relative energies of reactants and products. And at equilibrium, we are always going to favor the more stable species. So it's not just acid-based reactions, it's any equilibrium reaction. So the more stable the compound, the greater its concentration. All right, I say, I say I still have one minute, so please don't start to put your backpacks away. Unless that clock is wrong, you can come tell me afterwards and we'll adjust, okay? More stable the compound, the greater its concentration at equilibrium. If products are more stable than reactants, then concentration of products greater than concentration of reactants. And KEQ is greater than one. If products are less stable than reactants, then the concentration of products less than concentration of reactants. And KEQ is less than one. All right, it's 9.50, we'll stop right there and we will continue this next time. <laughs>